Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Colin Mayer. It's my very great pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon for this very special lecture. Governor Kuroda has been governor of the Bank of Japan since March 2013. Before that, he was president of the Asian Development Bank for some eight years. He joined the Ministry of Finance in 1967, having graduated in law from Tokyo University. And then some two years later, he came to this university, to Oxford to study the uh, MPhil in economics, which he completed in 1971. He rose to become Vice Minister of Finance for International Affairs in 2001, and then he became Special Advisor to the Cabinet in 2003 and Professor of Economics at Hitotsubashi University. His period of Governor at the Bank of Japan has been marked by the very successful program of quantitative easing which has provided some of the very important stimulus that the Japanese economy has needed over the last few years. So it's a very great pleasure to be able to introduce Governor Kuroda. Thank you very much uh, for your kind uh, introduction. And uh, of course, I am very honored to have the opportunity to give a speech here at Oxford University today. At the same time, it is also an extremely emotional experience from a personal point of view. As he uh, <coughs> indicated, I was a graduate student at Oxford University from 1969 to 71, and I fondly remember the time I spent here in my younger days. I was uh, dispatched here by Japan's Ministry of Finance to study uh, economics, particularly public finance. However, since uh, Lady Hicks, a prominent scholar in public finance, had already retired, uh, I decided to study monetary economics under Professor Richard Smethurst. In those days, Emeritus Professor John Richard Hicks also provided a series of seminars on monetary economics for graduate students. And I was fortunate enough to participate in them too. The lectures and seminars at Oxford gave me the opportunity to study monetary economics and monetary policy in earnest, but I certainly could not have imagined at the time that about half a century later, I would give a speech here about monetary policy as governor of the Bank of Japan. In my speech today, titled the role of expectations in monetary policy, evolution of theories and the Bank of Japan's experience, I would like to talk about the evolution of theoretical ideas about monetary policy and the conduct of monetary policy by the Bank of Japan in recent years. In April 2013, the Bank of Japan introduced quantitative and qualitative monetary easing, or QQE. This differs considerably from the policy framework employed until then and has since been further enhanced and strengthened. These policies conducted by the Bank of Japan together with policy initiatives by the central banks in Europe and the United States in recent years are frequently classified as unconventional monetary policies. However, 
The root of the ideas underlying these policies can be traced back to work by economists in the United Kingdom nearly a century ago. In today's speech, I would like to provide an overview of the debate in economics since the first half of the 20th century, discuss the implications for monetary policy today, and consider remaining issues. Monetary policy discussion by economists in the United Kingdom in the first half of the 20th century provide extremely useful insights into monetary policy today. I am particularly surprised by the fact that those insights from almost a century ago are relevant to the unconventional monetary policies in, adv in advanced economies in recent years. A British economist in the first half of the 20th century that everyone first and foremost thinks of probably is John Maynard Keynes, shown here on the first slide. Keynes, uh, the founder of macroeconomics, highlighted the role of central bank monetary policy in guiding long-term interest rates during a recession through the purchase and sale of long-term government bonds and other measures. As is well known, in 1933, Keynes sent an open letter to US President Roosevelt urging a reduction of long-term interest rates through purchases of long-term government bonds. At the same time, Keynes, in his seminar book, the General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, published in 1936, accurately pointed out that when long-term interest rates decline to certain levels, this can give rise to a liquidity trap, a situation in which long-term interest rates do not fall further and the monetary authorities loses effective control over interest rates because people expect interest rates to rise in the future and hold cash instead of investing in long-term bonds. What is surprising is that Keynes had predicted the possibility of a liquidity trap long before such a situation had ever arisen. In fact, although a liquidity tra trap had never actually arisen when the general theory was written, he stated that this limiting case might become practically important in future. As you all know, Keynes not only discussed the liquidity trap, but also keenly examined many other issues of macroeconomics from an academic standpoint and had a tremendous influence on macroeconomic policies afterward. However, regarding the topic of my speech today, which is expectations and monetary policy, another scholar providing extremely useful insight is Ralph Hotre, as shown on my next slide, a close friend and intellectual sparring partner of Keynes. As a government economist known for numerous publications written while acting as director of financial inquiries at the UK Treasury for a few decades, Hotre, Hotre uh, devised his own economic theories rooted in practice and highlighted the role of monetary factors in the business cycle. From an extremely early stage, he identified the importance of conducting monetary policy in a forward-looking manner. In his book, Monetary Reconstruction, published in 1923, he stated that it is not the past rise in prices, but the future rise that has to be counteracted. He also pointed out that the problem is a psychological one and that a very relevant factor in the psychological problem is the trader's expectations as to the intention of the authority which fixes rates. 
In other words, Hotre highlighted that private ent entities decide their actions based on expectations for the future, identifying at this extremely early stage in the study of economics that the central bank's policy stance toward future price stability is an important factor working on the expectations of such economic entities. Hotre also provides us with instructive insights about why interest rate control by the central bank produces significant policy effects. In his uh, 1938 book, A Century of Bank Rate, cited on my third slide, he argues that the pressure applied to traders by a moderate rise in the short-term rate of interest, say 1%, is undeniably very slight. Yet, apparently, the Bank of England always counted on a rise of 1% or even 0.5% having a noticeable effect. He continues by saying that when the Bank of England raises the official discount rate by 1%, a trader would reason that this was intended to have a restrictive effect on markets, and that if the effect was not brought about, the rate would simply go higher and higher till it was. Hotre thus probably was the first to clearly point out that the reason why a minor change in the policy interest rate creates a major policy effect is people's expectations regarding the future monetary policy stance of the central bank. I vividly remember hearing about this last point from uh, Professor John Richard Hicks during my days at Oxford. However, while Hotre called this policy effect resulting from people participating or anticipating in uh, anticipating the intention of the central bank, the psychological effect, Hicks argued that the effect was based on extremely rational behavior of economic entities. From a theoretical perspective, Hicks found this to be a stronger argument with regard to the transmission mechanism of monetary policy than Hotre's argument. As shown in my fourth slide, Hicks called this the central bank's announcement effect, saying that the central bank's policy should almost immediately result in a shift in expectations, and that what I learned from Hotre's analysis is that the classical bank rate system was strong, or could be strong, in its announcement effects. This identification of the announcement effect by Hicks is based on the so-called expectation theory with regard to long-term interest rates. He therefore can be said to have pointed out at an early stage the importance of what today is called forward guidance. This, out this brief outline indicates that nearly a century ago, British, British economists such as Keynes, Hotre, and Hicks had already introduced or anticipated key concepts related to the unconventional monetary policies implemented today, such as the liquidity trap, forward-looking monetary policy, and forward guidance. Although their arguments were largely conceptual, they were later formalized by scholars such as Friedman and Lucas, as well as the New Keynesians, and the essence of their arguments live, uh, <coughs> lives on in contemporary economics in a refined form. Central bank policymakers like myself have been influenced both directly and indirectly by the contribution of these British economists. Of particular importance is the point that 
a strong determination by the central bank to stabilize prices will work on people's expectations and increase the effectiveness of monetary policy. This is also the essence of the monetary easing that the Bank of Japan is currently pursuing. Based on these background considerations, I would now like to explain the Bank of Japan's policy conduct in recent years. Since the 1990s, economic volatility has sharply dec decreased in many advanced economies. Former Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke referred to this as the great moderation and argued that a major reason was the drama dramatic uh, improvement in the ability of central banks in those economies, including the UK, to stabilize inflation expectations through the introduction of measures such as inflation targeting. Meanwhile, Japan's economy found itself in a completely different situation. Japan experienced a major asset bubble from the late 1980s to the early 1990s, and following the collapse of the asset bubble, suffered a sharp economic slowdown and serious financial instability. Moreover, firms had to deal with the so-called three excessives, namely excess production facility capacity, excess employment, and excess debt, while financial institutions had to grapple with the non-performing loan problem. Please take a look at chart five. A bit complicated. Uh, while the negative legacy of the asset bubble had been more or less dealt with by the mid-2000s, Japan's potential growth rate, which had been around 4% in the early 1990s, dropped to about 1% by the late 1990s. On the price front, the annual rate of change in consumer prices I mean, consumer price inflation fell into negative territory in 1998 and generally remained negative over the following decade and a half. Against this background, inflation expectations also seem to have declined, although they were not ac accurately captured in a timely manner. On the monetary policy side, the policy interest rate, which was 6% in the early 1990s, had been lowered to 0.5% by 1995. At this point, conventional monetary easing measures through cuts in the short-term policy rate had been more or less exhausted. Paul Krugman dubbed this situation Japan's trap and stated that Japan had actually fallen into a liquidity trap, which had long been regarded as just a theoretical possibility written in the back pages of macroeconomic textbooks. In order to get out of this trap, the Bank of Japan introduced a zero interest rate policy in 1999, followed in 2001 by quantitative easing, in which the outstanding balance of current accounts that financial institutions hold at the Bank of Japan was set as the operating target for monetary uh, money market operations. Thus, the Bank of Japan pioneers pioneered the introduction of unconventional monetary policies, but unfortunately, Japan was unable to overcome deflation. Why did uh, Japan's economy fail to get out of the liquidity trap, even though the Bank of Japan had taken unprecedented monetary policy steps? With the benefit of hindsight, we now know that Japan faced a simultaneous decline in the natural rate of interest and inflation expectations. Under these circumstances, as nominal short-term interest rate faced the zero lower bound, it was difficult to lower real interest rates to levels well below the natural rate of interest 
and achieve sufficient monetary easing. As a result, the downturn in growth during this period caused a decline in prices, further reducing growth through the rise in real interest rates. In this way, weak economic growth and deflation reinforced each other over a long period. Then in 2008, the global financial crisis led to another sharp contraction in Japan's economy, as shown in uh, chart uh, slide six. Even though Japan's uh, financial institution had already resolved the non-performing loan problem by that time, and had only limited exposures to subprime related products, Japan experienced a precipitous decline in real GDP that was more severe or severer than that in Europe and the United States. Uh, United States, of course, was the epicenter of the crisis. There are a number of reasons for this, but what certainly played a role in that at that time, the policy interest rate in Japan was only 0.5%, unlike in Europe and the United States, where rate cuts of 3 to 4 percentage points were possible, there was little room for a monetary policy easing through cuts in the short-term policy interest rate. This episode highlights the importance of bring, bringing about an increase in the so-called neutral interest rate, that is, the nominal interest rate level that is neutral to economic activity by anchoring inflation expectations at about 2%, as well as the importance of securing the ability of monetary policy to respond. In March 2013, I took office as governor of the Bank of Japan and immediately introduced a new monetary policy regime called Quantitative, Quantitative and Qualitative Monetary Easing, or QQE, which was quite different from past regimes. QQE consists of two pillars. One, directly working on people's expectations through a price stability target of 2% and a strong and clear commitment to doing whatever it takes to achieve this. And two, directly encouraging a decline in long-term interest rates through large-scale purchases of long-term Japanese government bonds, or JGBs, for short. If inflation expectations rise as a result of the former and nominal long-term interest rates fall as a result of the latter, this will push real interest rates to levels below the natural rate of interest, even in the face of the zero lower bound. In additional steps, the Bank of Japan in January 2016 introduced a negative interest rate policy in order to address the strong headwinds caused by turbulence in global financial markets. The negative interest rate policy aimed at exerting further downward pressure on interest rates across the entire yield curve by pushing down the short end of the yield curve in combination with large-scale purchases of JGBs. Thereafter, in September 2016, the bank conducted a comprehensive assessment on developments in economic activity and prices, as well as policy effects since the introduction of QQE. Based on the findings, the bank introduced yield curve control which focuses on long-term interest rates in addition to short-term interest rate as the operating target. However, the basic approach of lowering nominal interest rate across the entire yield curve and lowering real interest rate by raising inflation expectations has remained unchanged. In modern central banking, QQE is qualified uh, classified as unconventional monetary policy. But from a somewhat longer perspective, it can be said to be a contemporary application of Hotre's theory on the importance of guiding expectations 
and Keynes theory that monetary easing can be conducted through the purchase of long-term government bonds. An older or old East Asian proverb, visiting old and learn new, says that one can derive new understanding from learning the lessons of the past. I think this is particularly apt with regard to the intellectual journey leading up to QQE. In practice, QQE has produced its intended effects. Inflation expectations climbed notably after the introduction of QQE. This demonstrates that a strong determination by the central bank pushes up people's forward-looking inflation expectations. In addition, the large-scale purchases of JGBs as part of QQE have exerted downward pressure on nominal interest rates across the entire yield curve. As a result, as shown in uh, slide seven, the Bank of Japan has succeeded in reducing real interest rates to levels well below the natural rate of interest for the first time in its two decades long battle with the zero lower bound on the short term policy interest rate. These monetary easing effects have stimulated economic activity both in the corporate and household sectors. And the output gap has improved substantially. As shown in slide eight, corporate profits are at historic high level. The unemployment rate has fallen to less than 3%, meaning that Japan has almost achieved full employment. Wages are rising moderately with a tightening of labor market conditions. As an especially noteworthy change is that the practice of regular increases in base pay, which had disappeared during the prolonged deflation since the second half of the 1990s, has returned and has now been observed for the fourth consecutive year. Sort of virtuous cycle between rising inflation and wage increase increases has been operating. In other words, Japan is no longer experiencing deflation in the sense of a continuous decline on prices. Japan's experience over the past four years illustrates the effectiveness of the kind of monetary policy approach that works, in, works on expectations uh, first pointed out by economists in the first half of the 20th century. That being said, while the policy <coughs> uh, approach has steered Japan's economy in the right direction, our intellectual journey has not yet completed. The rate of change in the consumer price index recently has been around 0%, and there is still a long way to go until the price stability target of 2% is achieved. The main reason is that inflation expectations, which had clearly risen as a result of the introduction of QQE, have since declined again and have continued to be subdued, as shown in slide nine. Our analysis at the Bank of Japan is that, as a result of prolonged deflation, the backward-looking or adaptive component in the formation of inflation expectations continues to be much stronger in Japan than in Europe and in the United States. Therefore, if for whatever reason, the observed inflation rate declines, even if only temporarily, this will tend to drag down inflation expectations. In fact, inflation expectations saw a decline on the back of the fall in the observed inflation rate, mainly due to a drop in crude oil prices since autumn 2014 by more than 70%, and to turbulence in global financial markets in 2015 and 2016, reflecting uncertainty regarding the prospects of emerging economies. The Bank of Japan aims to fundamentally dispel 
the differentiary mindset that has become entrenched among the, among the public. However, changing people's inflation expectations is not easy. As Hotre argued, the problem is psychological. In response to this situation, when the Bank of Japan introduced QQE with yield curve control in September last year, it also introduced an inflation overshooting commitment, which is uh, illustrated in slide 10. Specifically, the Bank of Japan committed itself to expanding the monetary base until the year-on-year -year rate of <coughs> increase in the observed CPI exceed 2% and stay above that target in a stable manner. The idea is that if people actually experience inflation above 2%, inflation expectations will rise through, even through the adaptive component of inflation expectation formation. At the same time, if people experience inflation above 2%, this will boost the, the credibility of the Bank of Japan's price stability target and the formation of inflation expectations will become more forward-looking, helping the Bank of Japan to anchor inflation expectations at about 2%. The problem that Japan's economy has faced since the second half of the 1990s were long regarded as specific to Japan. However, following the global financial crisis, which saw the collapse of an asset bubble and severe damage to the financial system, a relatively prolonged slow slowdown in economic growth and the fall in inflation rate have become an experience shared by many economies. As a result of the bold response of central banks based on the knowledge and the insights gained in the field of economics over the decades, a recurrence of the Great Depression was avoided and global concerns over deflation have faded to a considerable extent. However, the performance of the global economy today is by no means satisfactory. Looking back, monetary policy to work on expectations has played a major role in keeping inflation in check following the bout of high inflation worldwide during the 1970s. The introduction of inflation targeting in many economies since the 1990s, as well as the remarkable development in monetary policy theory implicitly focused on responding to high inflation. While these policies and theoretical developments helped to bring about a great moderation, central banks at the same time started to face a new challenge, namely how to appropriately manage inflation expectations in a low inflation environment under the zero lower bound. Central bankers and scholars have only just started to find responses to this new challenge both from a policy and a theoretical perspective. In particular, in particular with regard to the inflation expectation formation process, which likely differs across countries, regions, and period, more empirical analysis is needed. As a central bank, we need to examine con concrete measures to appropriately manage inflation expectations based on such analysis. The inflation overshooting commitment introduced by the Bank of Japan last year is one answer, representing a response to the specific situation in Japan. But I strongly hope that scholars and policymakers will further deepen the debate from a global perspective. British scholars produced sharp insights into the importance of expectations in monetary policy nearly a century ago. Nevertheless, the role of expectations continue to provide challenges, both old and new today. Thank you very much.
for your attention.